Hi, Reed. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. It's a real honor and a privilege. So you have worked in IP in the U.S. for many years. How is the current COVID-19 situation impacting the legal sector in general? And which are the major changes you've seen in the last few months? Well, thank you for having me, first of all, and I appreciate being on your, on your, on your, on your program. Um, you know, once COVID-19 hit, no one really knew exactly what to, what to, what to think of it and how the offices were going to rea react. So, you know, I, I practice patent prosecution, but also I'm in the federal court system. And I actually do have a few cases in the state court system. And all have been a little bit different. So in the USPTO, you're seeing more deadlines um, being extended. Uh, you know, you can respond to certain office actions and you pay fees. Uh, that was no longer the case. Now it can be, um, you know, extended for 30 days or so. Um, without a fee. So the USPTO is handling it in that way. Uh, in the state court system, I've got a couple trade secret cases. Um, and what ends up happening there is, is, is now it's in limbo. We, we actually don't know what's, um, hearings that I've had have been pushed back um, with no further guidelines. Um, you know, that is, that's one, I think the state court system is, is, is a little bit uh, behind the federal court system. The federal court system They've converted, you know, pretty much all my hearings to oral hearings uh, that I have in these cases to uh, to phone or video, um, and have pushed these hearings back a little bit, uh, thirty days or such, to to kind of deal with the COVID nineteen crisis. Um, so it's been very difficult, I guess, in the sense of prep because you're getting ready and uh, for certain hearings, and I've had you know settlement conferences and, and motion hearings uh, pushed back just because of the uncertainty of all this. Um, but I'm feeling, you know, with some of my cases in the federal court, it's slowly starting to normalize. Um, in fact, I was just on a settlement conference with a, with a judge in the federal court uh, system the other day. And she had mentioned that, you know, we may have a settlement conference that may be in person uh, on June 4th. She actually didn't know. Um, but then a couple of days ago, I got a, uh, there was an order that came out that said it was just going to be by phone only. So, you know, I think there's going to be some changes coming in the next couple of months, but, you know, we may start seeing in-person hearings maybe in, in July and August, but that's just a guess. Do you think they may, because of budgetary concerns, they may continue with the, uh, with the Zoom conferences or the, the electrical con conferences? I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I, it depends. I mean, I don't know if the federal court system, I know they're, they're burdened by a heavy docket. I don't know if they have any budgetary concerns, but you know, I think I'd read something where the Supreme court has decided to do their first hearing uh, on, I, I guess it was over video or something like that. And, you know, I, at the end of the day, I don't think video is going to come across uh, to a jury as well as it would if it was in person. So I think this may go on for a little while, but you know, as soon as it's possible to get back in the courtroom and, and have people you know, within that, that closing that distance, I think you're gonna start seeing a switch back to that. I don't think we're gonna stay in this situation. I think it's transitory. So you were recognized as super lawyer three years in a row. Uh, what do you think are the challenges and opportunities the current situation presents to patent litigation? Well, yeah. Gosh, um, you know, I, I, you know, it's just the online environment. I think, you know, I think when you're dealing with, I, I don't know if it's specific to patent litigation. I haven't had a kind of a Markman hearing uh, since the COVID-19 struck, but I can tell you defending depositions and taking depositions uh, for these cases is just a little bit more tricky and nuanced. Um, you know, for instance, I was at a deposition last week and just sharing the exhibits, um, you're just not able to read the reaction of the deponent as you normally would in person. Um, you know, Zoom makes nice features, and I think there's some other um, deposition, uh, third-party deposition vendors who have added onto that platform where you share an exhibit and you allow the deponent to make marks on the exhibit and that kind of thing. But you know, you never really know what's going on behind the scenes. Generally speaking, you can't have the deponent's counsel. Uh, coach the deponent. Um, but as we all know, you can have access to text messages and things like that. And I know we're not all in the same room, but it's not very difficult to, uh, to coach that deponent and not, be, uh, and, and not be caught, so to speak. So it's interesting, this online environment, you really have to navigate it uh, carefully and, and, and watch, but you can't read your deponent all that well. So 
Right. Right. You had mentioned before that it was in regards to jury cases, the jury may not be able, you may not be able to present your case as well in front of a jury uh, virtually. However, yeah. in the Markman cases, do you think it may be more fear um, besides for the fact that someone may be giving you a little bit of help on the side? Um, do you think it may be f fear for, for those, for those Markman trials? Well, not for Markman. You know, that what I was, was speaking to was actually depositions. Markman actually would probably be very benefit. I don't think there'd be much change um, between a Markman hearing in front of a judge, because that's where they're held, um, versus those who are online. Because at the end of the day, it's very technical. And during a Markman hearing, you're running through your, your, your set of exhibits to show why you think a certain claim term means something. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I don't really... I don't think it really matters all that much. You know, I think that a judge is going to have a different perspective on things versus a jury. Um, so I don't think you need that kind of persuasiveness that you'd normally have in front of a, a jury than in front of a judge. I mean, I, within reason, I guess. But you're sharing exhibits, you know, the same way you would uh, in a Markman hearing. Um, you know, it, it's just, you know, yeah. I mean, I don't think it's going to be that big of a difference for a Markman hearing as it would be in a deposition. Dealing with IP litigation, um, have you seen because of the, the COVID-19 situation, there are a lot of uh, financial impacts and it could be quite expensive litigation. Have you seen any clients stop a litigation that they may have done prior to, to the situation? No, because it, stopping is a, is a drastic a drastic move and, and I don't think we're there yet. I don't know if we're ever gonna get there, but I do have several pending litigations that I think, you know, that, that the clients will ask us to kind of dial back things a little bit, you know? I mean, we're still turning over every rock and stone to try to find, you know, what we need to find, but I think we're trying to be a little bit more efficient with the dollar and we make it go a little bit further knowing that you know, this could go on for a couple months. And, you know, if your trial, it depends where, if, you're, if your trial is, is, is three months out versus nine months out, you know, I think you're just going to be better off with a, with, with a later date um, than you would with an earlier date. Um, because there's certain things during trial, you just can't dial back. You know, once you get into that phase, you have your pretrial conference and you're getting close to trial, it's 100% and you're all in and it's kind of, you know, kind of guns blazing. Whereas if you had something pending and you're in discovery, you can kind of slow play it a little bit and try to try to wait it out and save the dollar. So I see that. So as an IP and technology litigator at Gordon Rees, you work in a wide range of technologies and industry sectors. Do you see the COVID-19 situation having a financial impact on any specific sec sectors? I haven't seen it, but I do. Um, well, I guess I, I changed that actually, you know, I represent several pet product companies and, you know, pet products are still going through the roof. People are still paying for, you know, pet beds and collars and braces and various things for their pets, you know, in the U S I think people love their pets just as much as their children almost. So that doesn't slow down. In fact, you know, it's the, the, the clients that, it, that are involved in this industry, they're still going strong. And I haven't heard anything from them um, that suggests any kind of dialing back. In fact, I've got one case that's, uh, that's pending um, that the client is, is very, very, feels very, very strong about. And that's going to be, you know, undertaken in the next month. So that hasn't stopped them. There may be many uh, foreign associates um, that, that rely, their bread and butter is on the U.S. innovation. What would you tell, if you had 30 seconds or less, what would you tell those foreign associates that rely on U.S. inventions? What can they expect from the innovation sector moving forward? I, I've, I've read several articles that, um, that suggested that innovation within companies is still, um, still moving forward. Um, they haven't dialed it back. Um, I think uh, that rep represents uh, strength in the U.S. economy, in the U.S. innovation. Um, I think that if foreign associates are looking at the U.S. Um, along those lines, I think what ends up happening is that um, 
you know, if this pandemic stretches any further, I think that um, there could be a possibility of some companies um, restricting um, their kind of uh, their innovation departments, their technology departments. Um, but I just don't think that uh, we're, we're there yet. Um, I, I also don't think that that on the whole, um, the the uh, technology uh, departments within large companies is on that kind of short list to get cut if financial resources are, are cut by the firm. I, I think they're because there's always um, there's always secondary markets for these types of uh, departments in the sense of you know one is protecting your innovation. Um, and securing those rights, and the other one is enforcing those rights and licensing those rights. So I, I think that because um, a patent grant uh, provides both kind of an exclusionary right, um, it gives that opportunity for, and, and when I say secondary markets, I'm talking about the buying and selling of patent, uh, patents themselves. So there is that one aspect of licensing a technology um, and there's that other aspect, that other aspect of aspect, excuse me, of actually selling off that patent grant in the secondary market by some other company that they want to enforce it or something like that. So the it term, once you once a patent is granted, you know you can make money out of both ways. You know you can license it or you can license it or sell it. So it, you know, it's less likely to be on that short list of of, of things to cut, in my opinion. So being in Los Angeles, close to Silicon Valley, would you say that there have been, for the startup space, have there been uh, cutbacks on those, not enough funding? No, no, I wouldn't think so. I mean, I'm not privy to that kind of information. I mean, but what I've seen within our firm, I, we're still growing. We still have, you know, clients demanding patent prosecution. From what I understand, that has not slowed. Um, I think what we're seeing mostly is a slowdown, and like I'd said, in litigation where you have that dial back in litigation. Litigation is still going forward and patent prosecution is still going forward. But, um, you know, from what I'm seeing, it, it, it hasn't slowed in the patent prosecution department.